Um, it's the late 19, no, wait, late 1500s. Okay, it's the late 1500s, like 1591, something like that. And then there is this really ugly, nasty Japanese dictator. His name is Hideyoshi. And so, yeah, it's hideous. So he's, he's a warlord in Japan. And, and, and one of the things that he was charged with doing is building an enormous statue to Buddha. This thing was huge. It took about uh, 50,000 men over five years to complete the thing. It was amazing. Um, and they built it in a shrine in Kyoto. Um, and so they had spent a lot of time, a lot of resource, um, and, and they built the thing. And, and about 1596, um, Kyoto is famous for earthquakes, right? There, it's a very seismically active region. And as, not long after they'd completed this thing, a huge earthquake came and shook the walls of the, the shrine. And it brought the roof of the shrine crashing down, and it completely wrecked this brand new statue, just annihilated it. And so here is this guy, Hideyoshi. He's put so much of his life into that. So he gets so mad that, that he takes a, a bow and arrow and he shoots at the thing. And he says, I put you here at great expense and you can't even look out after your own temple. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that profound? We are in a, in a series called 10 Simple Rules. It's the Ten Commandments. It's the rules that God has set in place for his chosen people to follow. Here's a little quiz. First commandment. Name it. Just out loud. Okay, good, good. Um, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay, so you got, you got one. Um, so this week we're going to work on number two. It's the second commandment. And, and it really, it's a lot like the first one. And it says this. I don't want to mess this up. It's found in the fourth chapter I'm sorry, the fourth, fourth verse of chapter 20. Thank goodness it's going to be on the screen for those of you who need it. It is uh, chapter 20, Exodus, verse 4. Okay, as soon as the pages stop turning, we'll read together. Why don't you say this first verse with me here, just, just down to waters below. Let's say it together. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. Thank you. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. I hate stoplights. I really don't like stoplights. I'm a very, I need to be at my destination. I, I, I mapped out my journey so that I arrive right on time. And if those things turn and I'm stuck, I'm not, I'm not a happy camper. Who's with me? I don't know if you've noticed this phenomenon, but in the city adjacent to here, they've taken them all off of sensors and tripwires. Every one of them is on a timer now. Anybody know the city manager? I need, a, I need to make a call. I can't take this thing because, because the, the reality is, is I am stuck at this light for like 45 seconds. And there's nobody at the other side. There's no one there. It's a good time to pray, <laughs> yes. Let me write that down. Good time to pray. Here's another thing it gives me a chance to do. I like to look at the cars beside me and see what's on their dashboard. You, do, you ever done that? Around, yeah, it is kind of creepy. <laughs> but hey, I've got 45 seconds, you know. I've got something, I've got to have something to do. Here, here's the thing. Um, around the holidays, uh, if you went to Dollar Tree, you could buy these little figurines. They had them on the ledge there. And it's this little kind of wobbling turkey or wobbling Santa. They had a couple of different figures. And, and so it got me thinking, uh, as I'm getting ready for, for, for today, is, is all kinds of people have all kinds of different things that they put on their dashboard. And a lot of times they put the most important thing in their life on the dashboard, right? Some people will have a little Buddha on the dashboard, some people will have a dancing lady on the dashboard. 
Some people have some fuzzy dice hanging from the rear view mirror in, on the dashboard. Sometime, sometimes we put some really interesting things on the dashboard. But if you want to know what a person really loves, if you want to know what they really serve, look at, look at what's there in those, those symbolic places. And, and most of the time you're going to find out that it isn't Jesus. It's not God. They've got those, those different things that remind them of, of the things that they believe can save them. Or the things that, that, that are going to bring them luck. The things that matter to the most are, are, are the ones that end in that spot. And sometimes you'll see um, things that are not appropriate. And it's, it's, it's scary and it's frightening. Here's, here's where I want us to turn back to this second commandment. No graven images. No graven images. We waste a lot of time on idols that can't do anything. You know, and we shoot bow and arrows at our idols that fail us. The things that we put on a pedestal and they don't come through when we need them to. Like the Japanese warrior, sometimes we forget that those idols are completely powerless. That's what happened with the children of Israel in the story of the Ten Commandments. See, Moses is up on the mountain and, and he's... Um, he's scribing, actually God's doing it, he's holding the tablets and God is using his finger to, to inscribe the, the commandments on the front and the back of the tablets. And what starts to happen is he didn't stop there, okay? Over, over the, the distance between Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 32, God is just unleashing an, a, a, an endless series of guidelines and rules and, 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 and this is his instructions for them. Meanwhile, the children of Israel are on the bottom of the mountain and and, and quite frankly, they're freaked out right now because there's the sound of thunder coming from the mountain. It's the voice of God, and it's shaking the whole mountain. And the, the, there's, there's smoke surrounding the, the mountain, and it's really getting tough to breathe. No pun intended. We're going to camp out here in the 32nd chapter of Exodus today. And this is where we want to pick up the story. So go over. This is what happened. If you turn the pages over there, you can see. If you've got the, if you've got the headlines over each different section, you can see that God is literally telling Moses, this is what I want from you. This is how you do the oil. This is what the breast piece for the, 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 the priest should look like. Um, you've got the incense. Here's how you deal with the atonement money. And, and all those things. And God is doing this. And they get so impatient they get so scared and so impatient that 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 some really dangerous things happen look at verse or chapter 32 verse 1 when the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain they gathered around Aaron and said come make us gods who will go before us as for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt we we don't know what has happened to him Aaron answered them Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. <laughs> Afterward they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Stop there for a second. They couldn't wait. They couldn't even wait. They were so quick to turn away from God and they had so little respect for, for Moses, here was the guy that snatched them out of slavery, out of bondage, and, 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 and now they're free, and, and now all of a sudden Moses has disappeared up the mountain, they don't know what happened to the guy, and, and, and they're hungry, and they want stuff now, they want their God now, they don't want to wait any longer. They wanted to worship at the feet of the God that brought them pleasure at a big party. And Aaron was quick to oblige them. How often is that us? That, that we, we know what we get from God. We know exactly what he provides to us. 
we know exactly what we get from his son, Jesus. We get eternal life and the promise, the promise that life is gonna be difficult. That's a promise. It's gonna be hard. You will face persecution. And, and yeah, there's this endless series of rules and, and regulations and guidelines. But listen, God promised along with those his blessing. He promised his blessing. What was it, a thousand generations? Endless, difficult to count. And we surrender all of that sometimes for a cheap thrill. Something that won't survive. That's not God's plan for us. He wants something more for us. Let's go on in the story. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down. Because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They've been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They've bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel. You brought this out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? <laughs> why should the Egyptians say it was the evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger. Relent and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. Look at verse 14. This is highlighter time. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. This part, this part of the story, it shows us the kind of God that God is, right? First, look, he knows us. He gets us. He called the Jewish people stiff-necked. Anybody ever been called stiff-necked? We're, we're stubborn. That's us. That's our address. <laughs> we want what we want or we pout, right? Am I wrong? <laughs> this is who we are. We, we see it in our children, okay? If they don't get their way, they stomp off and they, you know, muddle, mu mu murmur under their, their breath, you know? I'm, I'm guess I'm hoping he doesn't swear under his breath. <laughs> and they go to their room and they slam the door and they rail. God knew that. God knew that that was how we would be. He wired us that way. We're his children. And yet, he loves us. He knew that we would give in to sin and the desires of our hearts. He knew that we were going to be wicked from the start. Listen, second, we're reminded that God is a jealous God. He is so jealous for us. He wants all of us. He told Moses that he wanted to be left alone so he could burn in his anger. Now that kind of emotion doesn't come from someone who doesn't care. You know, that he got so angry because it's so important to him. He is a jealous God. He doesn't, like we talked about last week, he doesn't want to be second place. He doesn't want something else taking his place. When he said he didn't want to have other gods before him, he meant it. And when he tells us that he doesn't want us creating idols, fashioning things that aren't him, he meant it and he wasn't kidding. The third thing that we see in this passage is that God is full of grace and mercy. I, I, lo I love reading uh, with theatrics, okay? When you, re when you read the Bible, um, when we're doing our evening, I've got to kind of be quiet because the kids are trying to go to sleep and I'm trying to be, you know, focused and it's so it's nice and quiet. But when you can get up there 
and you can really speak life into the words that are coming out of the word, you can, you can hear God's anger. You can, you can hear the, 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 the frustration in his voice and the anger starting to, to build inside of him. And can you imagine Moses at that moment as he's standing in the presence of God just kind of feeling that, that burning that's happening in God. He says, go away. But here's the thing. In that, we can see his grace and his mercy because Moses said, Lord, don't punish the entire people for their actions. <laughs> the beautiful thing is that God changes his mind. He relents. And that gives us hope. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. And it, and it proves what we see in, in 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sins, he is what? Faithful. And he is just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's one thing that is important to see here. That, that action, that action that Jesus did of cleansing us by dying for our sins, it doesn't always keep us from the consequences of the sin in our life. Did, did you hear that? How many times have, have uh, you, you had the situation where your kids did something wrong and, and yeah, they said sorry for it, but there was, still, there was still some punishment that had to be given out? If I just say, ah, it's okay, run along, <laughs> they'll never learn. And, and the same thing happens with us. God, God has, the wages of sin is death, right? We talk about that a lot. There's, there's a consequence to our actions, and yet when we turn, God is faithful, and he is just, and he'll relent, and he changes his mind. See, Moses goes down the mountain, and he sees what the people have been doing. He sees what they've been at it. He finds this wild party going on, and he says to Aaron, what did you do? See, remember, Aaron, Aaron had a lot of jobs um, Aaron was Moses' brother, so they were family, so they had that bond. But even, even more severe in this case is that Aaron was basically Moses' right-hand man. Remember, Moses' Moses' concern was, was he didn't always communicate well, and Aaron was there to help him through those times. So here's Moses. He's on assignment. And Aaron's down there. To, he was, his responsibility was to take care of the people. And he allowed it to be, get completely out of hand. They, he built the calf. He fashioned the calf out of their gold. You had to feel for Moses at that moment that he must have felt so disappointed in what had happened. And not just disappointed, I imagine that Moses shared in a little bit of God's rage in that moment over what had happened. Aaron had blown it big time. And you remember what happens next in the story. He just spent all that time up the mountain with God. God inscribed the stuff with his own finger and Moses gets so angry that he smashes the tablets onto the ground. Sma Can you imagine? That, that's terrifying to me. But, and, and then he, he does something really strange. He pulverizes the, the gold and he puts it in their drink like Metamucil. <laughs> I wanted to use Gatorade as the example, but it just didn't work the same. And he made them drink it. Strange culture. I don't... I, don't, I couldn't even think about what, what that would look like in, in our day and time. But, but, but look at the frustration that was involved in that. He was so angry. But I love the thing that we see here about God. God is fair. He's fair. He proves his justice again. See, God is clear that those who keep his commandments, there is a blessing that will come to them. But for those who choose not to, there is consequences. Look, look, at verse, look at verse 27. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. 
the Levites did as Moses' commandment, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, you have been set apart to the Lord today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord, and perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Verse 31, so Moses went back to the Lord and said, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. The Lord replied to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. And the Lord struck the people with a plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. Listen, there's no way around it. There's no way around it. Unrepentance and defiance lead to death. Remember, I, I talked about that a little bit last week, that, you know, we, sometimes we come to church and we just want to be encouraged. We want our spirits to be lifted up, and, and we don't want anybody to say anything bad. But the reality is there is deep truth that we need to know coming from this, this story, that yes, we, that there's amazing things happening. That The first half hour of the service, I'd like to just repeat over and over and over again all week long. To hear you, and, and I kind of got, got to stand up there and see you through that, and some of you are raising your hands, and, and you're praising, and you're singing, and, and we're about to baptize Ashlyn, and, and there's just a, a that's, what, that's what church is about, but listen, we can't get away from this part. We have to spend time here. This is where we have to, to be for, because it's a tough lesson, but I want to remind you of something. Even though unrepentance and defiance lead to death, the truth is he gave us the rules because he loves us. He loves us. That's why he gave us those rules. That's why he gave us the commandments. It's not because he hates us. It's not because he wants to overburden us with so many regulations that we can't breathe. Yeah, there's things that we need to be aware of. But there is grace and mercy in Jesus. Great mercy and love in him. He wants to walk with us. He doesn't want to be replaced. He doesn't want to be replaced. Listen to how Isaiah says it in chapter 40 of Isaiah, starting in verse 18. With whom then will you compare God? To what image will you liken him? As for an idol, a metal worker casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A person too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. They look for a skilled worker to set up an idol that will not topple. Listen, we so often try to replace God with idols that can't save us. They can't talk. They can't move, they can't breathe, they can't fix anything, they are worthless. And we can easily let earthly stuff and earthly pursuits kind of try to push God from the throne that belongs to him alone. And it, it's an easy thing, but, but here, here's the coolest thing. God is really good at fashioning things. He's really good at creating things. I love that in the middle of what is a harsh winter, it's glorious outside. It's like a spring day. I want to go play ball with the kids. He's creative. He's imaginative. And you get to check out all of that creation today when you leave. Don't, don't confuse it. Don't worship the creation. Worship the creator. Don't create an idol. Worship the king. That's what he's telling us in, in this story. That's what he's telling us in this chapter. So that's the question I have this morning for all of us. What's on your dashboard? What's there? 
Now, I have, I have kids, as you know, and we buy beater cars, and they're old, and, and no offense, Terry, but man, this thing is old. And, and some of you have new cars that you will never put anything in there. Nothing is ever going to go. It's just, you know, you're buffing it out there, and nothing is going in that spot. But that doesn't mean that there isn't something there. In our culture right now, it's really difficult to find idols in, in our country. You don't find a lot of people gathering around statues to worship them. It happens, don't get me wrong, but, but it's, not, it's not something that happens a lot in our culture. But we can easily slip into the moments when we worship that thing that consumes us. When we found, okay, so an old friend of mine who I trusted a lot once criticized me for my deep devotion to the Los Angeles Dodgers. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so one, one day he decided to really call me out on it And, and he, he, he laid it on pretty thick And I didn't understand because, you know, I had my, I had my, my blue jeans on And I had my blue Dodger shirt on, my blue, my blue, blue cap I had my, my keychain um, I think at, at the time my, my cell phone had a Dodger case on it I checked the Dodger scores during, the, during church service um, It's just really, it's, it's really a thing and I got offended for a second. What are you talking about? I have it. It's an idol. It's, it's, border, it's bordering on idolatry. Scared me a little bit. And you angel fans, you are not alone. Okay. <laughs> That's how easy it is. I love Vince Scully to death, but I've probably placed him on the dashboard a couple of times in my life. I just want you to know that that's how easy it is. And here's the, here's the application. Here, here's the definition for us. Take anything in your life, anything in your life, whether it's baseball, whether it's a card collection, what, uh, just whatever it is. If you are more consumed with that than you are of the things of God, that is your idol. That is your idol. Anything that gets more of your attention than God does. And that's easy for us. It's very easy. So what's on your dashboard? Is there something in your life that, that you have placed there that moves God to the back seat? Because he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he gave all of his life, he gave his very life for you, and he doesn't want second place. Sure, we haven't, we, we may not have melted down our gold to create something to, to worship, but perhaps there is something that we need to pulverize. Maybe there's something that we need to, sm to smash and obliterate. And that's the story that I want to leave you with this morning. That's what I want to show you, is just like Moses he wanted us to know there are no golden calves. There are no graven images. And that's not Moses. That's not Moses talking. That's God talking. That's God showing us what we need to do to focus on who he is and to give him first place. And if you will, to put him on the dashboard so that the other guy in the car can see at the red light so that the guy at the supermarket can see, so that the guy at your workplace can see, so the girl at the school can see that there is one person that you serve and there are no idols, only him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. So God, we... We thank you for, um, God, for who you are and the greatness of who you are. And God, we don't understand the, the grace and mercy that you have bestowed on us. And we sit in your presence this morning thanking you for all that you've done. And God, we, we confess that sometimes we're, we're those stiff-necked people who just can't wait for you. We, we, we've got to have something else. We've got to have something that we can touch, that we can see, that we can hold. God, would you forgive us for when our faith fails? 
Would you forgive us when we place other things in our life more important than you? So, so maybe that is you this morning. Maybe there's a part of you that's built your own golden calf. And maybe, maybe you have placed God in, in a role of second place. And we know who he wants us to be. And we know who he wants to be in our lives. First place. So if that's you this morning and, and you would like to pray, uh, Kurt and some of the folks will be up here as we sing. And you can come and, and, and they would love to pray for you. If, if you're sick and, and would like to be prayed over, they'll be down here as well. But here's the thing for us, God, that we see. Lord, you are a loving father and you are jealous for us. You want every bit of us, nothing held back, nothing in reserve. You want all of us. So Lord, we will give you ourselves and we will ask you to shape in us and mold us into the people that you want us to be. So God, thank you for your mercy and your grace to us. Thank you for the way that you show us how to live. And Lord, as we leave this place today, would we leave changed? better than we came because of who you are and what your son Jesus has done for us. For God, we pray all of these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen.